Okay, welcome back everybody from lunch. I hope you had coffee after lunch with a big meal like that, with cheese, you just want to fall asleep. And so, uh, so I had coffee to make sure I would not fall asleep during my own talk. <laughs> okay, so we're moving on to uh, things that I think I find personally more interesting. What I, what, my first lecture were things that you just have to say or, or else how do you give an introduction to nonlinear optics? Now we're going to talk about things that I find personally interesting. So self-action effects in nonlinear optics. And what we mean by self-action is how does a beam of light influence its own propagation uh, through a material? And broadly speaking, we can talk about three types of self-action effects. One is self-focusing, where a beam of light originally collimated spontaneously comes to a focus inside of a material. We can talk about self-trapping, in which a beam of light propagates without diffraction over a distance much longer than its nominal uh, Rayleigh range. And the third process is small-scale filamentation. Here a laser beam breaks up into a very large number of small components, looking a bit like a speckle pattern. So. Uh, let, well, let's, let's look at the processes one at a time, and let's see how we describe them theoretically. So, uh, first of all, did I have... Uh, okay, let's assume that the laser power is greater than some critical power for self-focusing. We'll talk about that in a minute. And let's ask the following question. How far into the medium does the beam have to propagate before you reach the self-focus? and let's call this distance uh, z sub f, and let's say that here's your initial laser beam, roughly a Gaussian, peak intensity I naught, diameter twice R naught. And we use, we are in France, we use Fermat's principle to, to, to do this. Uh, about the only time in my life I've ever actually used Fermat's principle. Uh, so we argue that the optical path length along this ray has to be the same as the optical path length along this ray. And the optical path length is the physical length distance here. Now, this is an estimate. So, uh, okay, so, so for this ray here, we say it's the distance, and we will take the refractive index, including the nonlinear contribution, and we'll call the intensity I naught. For this marginal ray here, let's say we're talking about half the peak intensity. So we'll put a factor of one half here. Then we equate these two expressions. Very simple calculation. We find that the distance to the self-focus is R naught times the square root of N naught over N to I. Or more generally, the nominal refractive index divided by the increment uh, to the refractive index. And we can write this result uh, in any of these ways here, uh, including write, writing it in terms of this critical power for, for self-focusing. So uh, now that we're talking about self-focusing, let me also point out that self-focusing is a very accurate way of measuring chi-3, or equivalently measuring N2. And uh, this is called the Z-scan method. And here's the idea. You take a laser beam, you bring it to a focus, you take the sample that you want to measure, you slowly translate the sample through the focal region of the laser beam. You then place a pinhole here and a detector behind the pinhole. If you measure the transmission, or the transmitted power, as a function of this distance Z, you will get a curve that looks something like this. And the reason is that uh, the presence of this sample will, uh, will change the focal point. It will move it either to the right or to the left. The beam still diffracts at approximately the same angle, so either more or less of the light will get through. Uh, now, uh, this gives the real part of chi-3. What if you want to measure the imaginary part of chi-3 well, then all you have to do is remove this pinhole, and you ask how much of the light gets transmitted through the sample. And uh, so, for example, if the transmission goes up, 
in the focal region, that would be the normal situa situation of saturable absorption. Now, I know it's right after lunch, and nobody wants to take a quiz right after lunch, but the way I drew this picture, is chi-3 positive or is it negative? I will give each of you a few moments to think, and then we will take a vote. Of course, the Ottawa students have already seen this, right? <laughs> I think. People want more time? Or are you as ready as you will ever be? OK, so you only get, uh, there's two answers, chi-3 positive, chi-3 negative. How many people think chi-3 is positive? The hands aren't up very high. How many think chi-3 is negative? OK, I think uh, democracy says that chi-3 is negative. Now, let's see if the laws of physics agree with you. So let's see, if chi-3 were positive, it would move the focal point to the left. If chi-3 is, uh, posit is negative, it would move the focal point to the right. That puts the focal point closer to the pinhole. So when Z is negative, as it is here, the transmission would go up. So, so this, as drawn, was for chi-3 negative. Of course, it's because I drew it backwards the first time I drew this 10 years ago. And then I realized that this is actually good because if I couldn't figure it out, <laughs> this would be a small challenge to the people in the class. Okay, and uh, just, to, just to let you know that this is for real, uh, this is some actual Z-scan data uh, from my own uh, research group. Uh, so for carbon disulfide, I said that this was a calibration standard. So this is what we got, and this agrees with the literature value close enough. And here was a gold silica composite. Well, I said before that gold is highly nonlinear. You can disperse gold uh, uh, nanoparticles in, in silica glass, and this was the transmission that we received. And it was uh, Sheik Baha'i and his co-workers in, uh, in Central Florida uh, who came up with this idea. Okay, now, uh, what about self-trapping? Just to remind you, self-trapping is this process here. Now, uh, I mean, there's lots of ways of doing this. This was the model that Professor Towns came up with himself. And here's how the argument goes. Uh, let's say that here is the filament. So outside of the filament, the refractive index is its nominal value. Inside the filament, the refractive index has a uh, nonlinear contribution, which we can take to be N2I. Now, in a, uh, uh, in a filament of uh, finite diameter, uh, there will be a diffractive spreading of the beam. There will be a characteristic ang angular spread and we require that every ray in this bundle undergoes total internal reflection. So as drawn, this ray of light is not trapped in, in, trapped in, in the uh, filament. But if we make delta N a little bit larger, then this ray of light would undergo total internal reflection. So, you need this picture, and you, know, and you need Snell's law, and that's all it takes. And, and what you find is that the critical power for self-focusing is given by this expression here. Uh, you can take this model and also calculate the radial profile of a self-trap beam, and you get something that looks like this. Some people call this the town's profile. It does not have an analytic solution. Uh, it's not a Gaussian, but it looks a whole lot like a Gaussian. Now, look at this result, and there's some uh, interesting features of this result. First of all, it's a critical power, not a critical intensity. You say to yourself, but I thought that nonlinear optical effects depend on the intensity. Why is it that this depends on a critical power? 
And of course, the answer is that if the diameter gets bigger, then the intensity gets lower. But if the diameter gets bigger, the beam wasn't trying so hard to diffract. So the balance between self-focusing and diffraction depends only on the total power of the beam and, and not on the uh, intensity of the beam. This also perhaps makes anybody with common sense suspect that this type of self-trapping is not stable because if the power has to have exactly the right value, it tells you that if there's a small fluctuation in the power, things will go wrong. Uh, either the, uh, if the power fluctuates upward, the beam will collapse. If the power fluctuates downward, the beam will be expelled from the fiber. And in fact, that intuition is correct, that self-trapping in two transverse dimensions is unstable. As it turns out, self-trapping in one transverse dimension is stable. And I bet that will be pursued in talks that you hear later on this week. Okay, so uh, here, here's a way of understanding that same result. Just same idea, just stated differently. Uh, well, the word spatial soliton is equivalently used to mean a self-trapped filament of light. So just two different ways of expressing the same thought. Uh, a soliton propagates with a tr uniform transverse dimension because of a perfect balance between diffraction and self-focusing. And here I draw this little picture. Uh, I like simple pictures. Yeah, complicated things, I mean, if you don't understand something that's complicated, you have an excuse. But uh, you have something simple, you say, now I understand. Okay, so a beam of light on its own will tend to diffract, but if N2 is positive, it will tend to self-focus. And if you have an exact perfect balance between these two effects, the beam will propagate with neither spreading nor focusing. And this is how we understand the existence of a spatial soliton. Uh, okay, uh, now at a, at a more formal level, uh, it turns out, well, we were just talking about spatial solitons in which the nonlinearity balances the effects of diffraction. And if you want to describe this theoretically, uh, you end up with an equation that looks like this. Uh, this is the propagation in the z direction. This transverse this is the transverse part of the, <coughs> part of the Laplacian. This is what describes the tendency of the beam to, to spread due to diffraction. And this term here is the nonlinear uh, contribution. So uh, you get a self-trapped filament or a spatial soliton if this term, if this term plus this term is exactly equal to zero. Now, you can also work out the theory of a, of a pulse of light propagating through a dispersive nonlinear material. Uh, so, you have a pulse of light <laughs> propagating through a material. The material is nonlinear, but it's also dispersive. Because the material is dispersive, the pulse will tend to broaden in time. Uh, if you get a perfect balance, between the nonlinear response and the tendency of the pulse to spread in time. Here, K2 is the, uh, co is the group velocity dispersion coefficient. And those of you who do not know about the group velocity dispersion coefficient, you will within 24 hours because the uh, talk of Professor Malo best I can do, better than this morning. The, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the talk of Professor Malo is going to tell about soliton propagation in, in optical fibers. Crucial thing to note, if you're mathematically inclined, is that these two equations have exactly the same form. So, uh, so that's why they were both called solitons. That's why you should really say whether you're talking about spatial solitons or temporal solitons, unless you're thinking mathematically in which you just say solitons because it's the same equation in both cases. Uh, here is something that is really cute that, uh, that you should know about self-focusing. And uh, 
Is Majid here? Okay. So, uh, well, this work was done at St. Andrews. He was at Self An He was at St. Andrews when this happened. So, uh, so uh, Wilson Sibbett and his groups discovered that a titanium sapphire laser will self mold lock. Now, those of you who followed the early history of laser physics, not too many of us are old enough, are we? <laughs> if those of you who studied the early uh, development of laser physics know that people worked extremely hard to learn how to make a laser mold lock. They would put saturable absorbers into the cavity, but then the laser itself decides when to fire, so then they would put uh, some type of a, uh, of a modulator in, inside the cavity, but then that didn't provide enough modulation, so they put both a saturable absorber and a modulator inside the cavity. Uh, so people thought that making a laser mold lock was technologically very different. Wilson Sibbett and his students were in the laboratory, and I think one of them accidentally kicked the optical table, and all of a sudden the laser started mode locking. Uh, so, uh, so from then on, people, you know, Paul Corcoran is going to tell you the whole story, so I, I won't ruin his story. But, but, but here's what people think is going on, is that if the laser is not mode locked, the peak intensity is going to be very small. The self-focusing will not happen very effectively. If the, if the laser intensity is higher, then you will get a degree of self-focusing. The beam becomes smaller. Now, here we show an aperture inside the cavity. Even if you don't have a physical aperture, you will have an aperture. It could be the edge of a mirror, the edge of a lens. It could be the fact that the gain medium, uh, you have gain only where the pump laser is present. Okay, so, uh, so this is really cute. It's that the self-focusing self process is believed to, to be what causes the titanium sapphire, sapphire laser to self-mode lock. Uh, okay, and the last process that we were talking about is small-scale filamentation. And here is the conceptual understanding of what's happening. You start off with a, a laser wavefront that is almost a plane wave, but it's not perfect. I mean, you, you always have some uh, fluctuations on the wavefront. It turns out that nature does not like perfection, or at least nature will fight you all the way. Uh, these perfections on the wavefront will tend to be amplified by a four-wave mixing process. So as the beam propagates through the material, these wavefront uh, irregularities tend to grow at the expense of the dominant central component, and eventually the beam actually breaks up into individual components. The way we can understand this is, uh, I mean, here, here is the central component of the laser beam. Here are two spatial side modes. We call K1 and K, that's supposed to be a minus, K minus one. Uh, and uh, if you go through the theory of forward four-wave mixing, and it is in the book if you want to read through it, uh, it turns out that these side modes will experience exponential growth. I mean, here's the solution telling you that they uh, experience exponential growth. Here's the exponential growth rate. So lambda is sort of an eigenvalue because this has the form of, of an eigenvalue equation. This tells you that certain transverse wave vectors will tend to experience uh, amplification, but there's an optimum wave vector that sees uh, the most amplification, and this wave vector sets the transverse scale of the structure that, that, is, that is formed here. Now, a, a detailed calculation and this is not the right moment to go through the detailed calculation, tells you that at least to order of magnitude, each one of these little filaments in this structure carries power. How much power do you think? P-critical. So nature loves P-critical. If, if you excite this with a beam with a power much greater than P-critical, it will break up into N filaments so that each one of these filaments K 
carries and critical worth of power. Uh, having said that, here's some results from my group uh, 13 years ago, uh, which, uh, uh, which, is, which we found quite astounding. You know, filamentation usually produces a random pattern that looks like this. One day, my students walked into the laboratory and looked at the wall, and they found that depending on how they tuned the laser, they would either get a honeycomb structure or this uh, periodic uh, uh, roll pattern. So within the field of nonlinear dynamics, there's always been an intrigue over spontaneous pattern formation. And this is an example of, of spontaneous pattern formation. Uh, I find it still quite remarkable. There are some nonlinear systems that inherently drive themselves to chaotic behavior. There are other nonlinear systems that will tend to evolve into this uh, very stable type of behavior. And the honest truth is I don't know when one happens and when the other happens. And I don't think there's a broad understanding of these two very different limits of nonlinear dynamics. Uh, oh, and this, uh, uh, this, this is an experiment we did in my group just a few years ago. Uh, let's say you take a uh, spatially coherent beam, plane wave send it into an N2 type medium, let uh, filamentation begin, but adjust the intensity so that the filamentation is not fully developed. What, and you then examine the output beam and you discover that a spatially coherent beam at the input turns into a spatially incoherent beam at the output. Well, it grows from noise, so. Uh, so, so uh, because it grows from noise, that's the source of the randomness here. But we think that this could be very important for some applications. Uh, oftentimes, you want to use laser light because it's intense, but you don't want it to form speckles. So if you can find something that has the intensity of laser light, but does not have the coherence of laser light, you don't have to worry about speckles forming. And, uh, uh, this is a mechanism that can perhaps do that. Okay, uh, next topic, local field effects in nonlinear optics. And when I say local field effects, I mean this in the sense of the Lorentz, Lorentz law. You've heard of that? Or the clausius masati relation? You've heard of that? Okay. It's the same thing. <clears throat> Chemists call it Clausius Masati, and physicists tend to call it Lorentz Lorenz, but with a lot of crosstalk between the two disciplines. Okay, so, so let, let's first of all just remind ourselves of the Lorentz Lorenz law. We're not going to do a derivation of it here, but Lorentz asked himself the following question. Let's say that you have a material, and let's say you have a laser that produces an electric field E. Of course, there will be, let's start off with just linear optics. There will be a linear polarization induced in the material. And now, let's say you take uh, any, you, you just at random choose one atom inside this material, and you ask, what is the field that this atom experiences? Is it E? Well, Lorentz says, no, it's not E, because inside the material, the electric field is the sum of the applied field plus the reaction of every atom in the material. But you have to exclude its own reaction to find the, well, let's call it the local field. He says the local field is the field that a particular atom would experience. Uh, uh, Lorentz says, that it is not E, but it's E plus four pi, four thirds pi times P. Uh, so it's as if nature can't decide whether it's the E field or the D field, so nature chooses something in between, 
and, and that's the one that, uh, that a typical atom inside the material will experience. So uh, this, is, this is called the Lorentz local field. So, uh, 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 okay. Uh, based on this assumption, one can derive the fact that the linear susceptibility is not just n times alpha. Here, alpha is the polarizability per atom, n is the number density of atoms. Your first thought would be that chi 1 is just n times alpha, but there's actually this correction term that comes out from application of Lorentz's thinking. Uh, now, this is quite remarkable because if 4 pi over 3 times n alpha is equal to 1, then 1 minus 1 is 0. And this says that uh, chi 1 is infinite. And you say, is that physical or is it not? Well, it depends on what, how you think about it. But there are materials that can possess a permanent electric dipole moment. And for these materials, uh, this quantity, well, this quantity does, uh, the denominator here does vanish. Uh, so, so in that sense, there's an infinite response, meaning that you develop a polarization even though you did not apply an electric field to the material. So, that, so that's one uh, remarkable thought here. Also, the Lorentz-Lorenz law can be just rewritten in this form here, uh, just knowing the relationship between chi and uh, the dielectric constant. Epsilon is 1 plus 4 pi chi. You can rewrite this expression in this form here. Uh, again, telling you that the dielectric constant uh, is, uh, is not just given by n times alpha, but contains this correction term. Uh, now, you look at this and you say to yourself, chi 1 is always going to be a little bit bigger than n times alpha. Hmm. The correction term makes the physical effect bigger not smaller than it would have been without putting this correction term in. How do we understand this? Well, uh, this expression relating, this expression for E local, depending on E and P, where P is chi 1 times E, can be rewritten in the following form here. That the local field is the macroscopic electric field times a correction factor which is called the local field factor, and this is epsilon plus 2 over 3. Epsilon plus 2 over 3 is going to be larger than 1 for most materials, leading to the remarkable conclusion, at least for those of us who do nonlinear optics, that the average molecule in a material feels an electric field bigger than the spatially average field inside the material. If that is true, then you think this might be an even bigger correction for the case of nonlinear optics. So I guess the first thing you want to know is should you believe any of this? Uh, so when I started working on these things, that's the first thing that my students and I did was to say, how do we know that Lorentz was right? Well, he was a smart man. We assume he was right, but, can, but, but what are the laboratory consequences? So here is one form of the Lorentz-Lorenz law. This is the polarizability, well, written in strange units, uh, according to the Lorentz model of the atom, which both uh, uh, Professor Boulanger and I mentioned in the morning talks. Now, if you take this expression for alpha, introduce it into this equation, solve it for epsilon, you get this result here which leads to the remarkable conclusion that the resonance in the polarizability is at a different frequency than the uh, resonance in epsilon. Strange, right? We can think of this as a microscopic quantity. We can think of this as a macroscopic quantity. But the resonance frequency of, of the single atom is different from the resonance frequency of a macroscopic collection of such atoms. 
And this quantity here is called the Lorentz redshift. So my students and I went out to try to measure it. And what we did is we took a potassium vapor. Uh, with a potassium vapor, uh, the, uh, the number density of atoms grows exponentially with the temperature. So by taking this vapor cell and doing a measurement as a function of temperature, you, you can see how the reflection, this is the reflection from the interface between a sapphire window and the potassium vapor, uh, how that depends on the number density. And here's the experiment, here's theory, uh, not enough time to go through all the details, but uh, note that there is a redshift, that as you gradually increase the number density of atoms inside this cell, the resonance, well, in epsilon, which then leads to a shift in the spectrum of the reflectivity, according to the Fresnel reflection coefficient, also shifts to the red. Okay, so in 1991, my students and I said, yep, we, we've at least seen one experimental, piece of experimental evidence that the Lorentz-Lorenz law uh, is correct. So uh, then what are the implications of this for nonlinear optics? And uh, well, Bloomberg and again had this all right back in 1962 in the paper with Armstrong. Uh, Bloomberg points out, this is just, he did in general, this is just an example, that the expression for chi 3 will depend on the number density of atoms, the nonlinear coefficient per atom, times the Lorentz local field factor in this form here. L modulus squared times L squared. And again, the local field factor is epsilon plus two over three. Let's put in numbers just for fun. Let's say that the refractive index is two. Then that tells you that the uh, local field factor is equal to two, but two to the fourth power is 16. So uh, this is telling you that the nonlinear response is 16 times larger, well, than what you would have thought if you, if you didn't do the calculation correct. I mean, it, it's not that we've made it larger, but it, it's, it's that the local, the uh, naive theory fails. Uh, but that piece of insight asks us if we can perhaps manipulate the local field effects for our benefit, especially in the development of composite materials for nonlinear optics. So there's been a, a, a very large community. Uh, certainly I'm not the only player. Uh, there are many, many people who are very interested in this question of uh, can, we, can we synthesize nanocomposite materials that will lead to an increase in the nonlinear optical response? I think Vladimir Shalayev would be a key example of, of somebody who's been pushing on this uh, for at least 20 years now. Here are some different ways in which you can imagine making a composite material. You could, uh, and in all these cases, I'm thinking that all this structure is at a sub-wavelength scale. Because of that, you can talk about an effective value of the refractive index. This structure is really there, but the wavelength of light is very big. So uh, the, the, the light just feels an effective refractive index, but that effective refractive index is strongly modified by this underlying structure. So in the Maxwell-Garnet model, we think of nanoparticles embedded in a host. In the Brueggemann model, we think of maybe a porous structure with the pores filled by a different material. These nanoparticles could be arranged in a fractal manner, or you could just imagine uh, uh, situations in which you have layered geometries. Now, uh, the, the uh, conclusion, which I'll get to in a minute, is that in each one of these cases, one can find situations in which the volume average chi-3 is larger than the chi-3 of any of the constituent materials. Of course, in linear optics, that would be impossible. 
but the whole point is that this is not linear optics. And in a nonlinear situation, you can actually find situations in which the volume average chi-3 is bigger than any one of the starting chi-3s. You ask, how could that even be possible? Well, in a composite material, the electric field is not uniformly distributed. Just because it is non-uniform, the electric field, because, because the divergence of D is equal to zero, uh, the electric field is not going to be the same here as it is here. And if you arrange things correctly, perhaps the electric field is larger than the spatial average in the more nonlinear constituent, smaller than average in the less nonlinear constituent, but being nonlinear, you win big by doing things that way. Okay, actually all of this can be understood in terms of the theory that we've developed uh, for, local, for local field effects. So this is, the, well, this is one way of writing the expression that the effect of chi-3 is the chi-3 of the nonlinear constituent, the fraction of the material made up of that nonlinear constituent, and times this factor L squared times L modulus squared. Now, it turns out that this is a, as best I know, a universal result. It's simply that in different situations, you have a different expression for the local field factor. I already said that for a homogeneous material, it's epsilon plus two over three. For the uh, Maxwell-Garnet model, uh, where you have particles of dielectric constant epsilon m embedded in a host of dielectric constant epsilon h, the local field factor is this. And for a layer geometry, depending on whether the field is polarized this way or this way, you get one of these two results. Okay, so, so, uh, so we did some of these measurements to test this out. And the first one we did was alternating layers of titanium dioxide and a conjugated polymer. From this picture here, you can just see what's going on. If you come in at normal incidence, there will be no enhancement of electric field. But if you come in at oblique incidence, there will be a component of the electric field perpendicular to the plane of the layers. And since uh, D is, since D perpendicular to the plane of the layers is, uh, is constant as you move from one layer to the next. That means that epsilon times E is continuous, and that means that the field is stronger in the field with the lower value of the dielectric constant. So in this first experiment here, we found a 35% enhancement in uh, chi-3. But then a few years later, we found a different system in which there was just a better uh, in, which the, in which the materials perform better. We found in materials in which the dielectric contrast, the ratio of epsilon in one material to the other was larger, and we got a factor of three enhancement. So, uh, okay, so, so local field effects, it can be very interesting and very useful in determining the size of nonlinear optical effects. Now let's get back to this issue that I raised toward the end of the morning lecture uh, in which I said that metals have very strong nonlinearity, uh, but that metals are not transmitting. So what can we do about that? So uh, let me talk you through the logic of this. Uh, metals have a very large nonlinearity but low transmission but they have low transmission because the metals are highly reflecting, not because they're absorbing, a crucial point. If you turn light into heat, nonlinear optics is over with. If, you, uh, if the light reflects, then you still have the light, and you can put another mirror and send it back into the material. So, so uh, here's uh, what we did. We compared two different situations, actually in copper with this case. Uh, we had a bulk slab of copper, 80 nanometers thick, we then had another sample that contained 80 nanometers of copper, but spread into, uh, into five, one, two, three, four, in, into five layers, each uh, 16 uh, nanometers thick. Uh, here you get a 
here you get almost no transmission. But here, at the right wavelength, you tune the wavelength here, this becomes a resonator, resonant transmitter, lossy, but still a resonant transmitter. And you get overall 10% transmission, and you get a reasonably large electric field strength at the metal layers. So we call this accessing the optical nonlinearity of metals because we, uh, we sort of tricked the light into tunneling through the metal, even though in the bulk it would not be able to go through the metal. And then in, in the experiment we found, uh, we, we, we found that we got a nonlinear optical response that was 12 times larger for the uh, metal dielectric uh, photonic crystal than we did for the case of the bulk copper. Okay, so this is one trick you can use to force the light to interact with the metal, even though metals in bulk are not highly transmitting. Now, there, there's another feature of, of metals, metal dielectric composites, that they show very large local field effects. Maybe the emphasis here is on very. So, uh, as a first year graduate student, but if you're European, maybe as an undergraduate, <laughs> you, you worked out the problem of a dielectric sphere embedded in a uniform background material in the presence of an otherwise uniform electric field, and you were asked to calculate the field inside of this sphere, and you found that the field is uniform. In fact, you, you found even that if you replace the sphere by an ellipsoid, you still get a uniform field inside the material, and that the electric field inside the material is related to the field, well, far away from the material by this form here. Hmm. That's what you found. That's the, Max, that, that's the Maxwell Garnet formula I had two, two slides earlier, right? So, so, so I didn't just pull that out of the air. And you now you've actually derived this, probably many of you in your lives already. So this is how the field inside is related to the field outside. But now let's assume that this particle is actually a metal. And the key characteristic of a metal, at least if you're an optics person, is that for a metal, the real part of the dielectric constant is negative. That's almost the definition, unless you're an electrical engineer and you say metals conduct electricity. But, but I would claim that our definition is more universal because the, the ancients in ancient Greece, people knew that metals were shiny <laughs> long before electricity was, uh, uh, was even known about. So I think that the fact that metals are shiny is really the defining characteristic of, of metals uh, or that the dielectric constant is negative. Now, but, but because the dielectric constant is negative, uh, it means that there's a, well, it's, it's negative, and for a metal, the dielectric constant is very strongly frequency dependent. That means there's a certain wavelength at which the real part of the denominator will vanish. That situation is called the plasmon resonance uh, of the metallic particle, and uh, at, at resonance, the real part of the denominator vanishes. The only thing that's left over is the imaginary part of the dielectric constant of the metal. And this ratio here can be somewhere in the range of 3 to 30. This is, in a sense, the quality factor of the surface plasmon resonance. So 30, 30 to the fourth power is a million. So, uh, so yeah, now you understand maybe, why people are so excited about plasmonics is because you get a huge enhancement of the uh, nonlinear response. Uh, in fact, this is not the only thing going on, but in surface-enhanced Raman scattering, effects like this play a key role in leading to the very large optical response. So uh, this is cute. Well, this is the oldest one I found myself. But the Romans knew that if you put gold particles into glass, you get red colored glass. Uh, well, we understand now. It's because there's a surface plasmon resonance in the blue. All the blue light gets absorbed, and the only thing that's left over is the red. 
But if you think about this broadly, this tells you why composite materials are so exciting, because they can possess properties that are very different from those of their constituents. So common sense would tell me that if I take gold particles and embed them in glass, I would end up with gold-colored glass. But you don't. You get red glass. This is even the linear properties. So you, you can just imagine what, how profoundly you will influence the nonlinear properties of a material by forming it uh, in, into a composite. OK, so this is also cute. And I will tell you about it. Uh, uh, Christos Flitsanis made the original prediction, uh, but then my students and I went and did the experiment uh, based on his original prediction. Of course, I mean, the specifics here were our experimental uh, uh, configuration. So let's imagine putting gold nanoparticles in a liquid dye solution <clears throat> and we choose components, the gold nanoparticles and the liquid dye solution so that both constituents are reverse saturable absorbers, meaning that the imaginary part of chi 3 is positive. This is just a sign convention. Uh, reverse saturable absorber, imaginary part of chi 3 is positive. Now, what is the effective nonlinear susceptibility of the composite? Well, this is what we had before. This is just the contribution from the uh, background dye solution. I remind you that the local field factor is purely imaginary at resonance. Now, L squared mod L squared comes in with a minus sign. That means that in a composite material, the nonlinear response of the gold has the opposite sign of the intrinsic nonlinear response of the gold. That means that even though both of these chi threes have the same sign, you can get a cancellation between them. Uh, a cancellation of the two contributions can occur even though they have the same sign. And here's the experiment that we did. Okay, it, it was a Z scan again. Uh, an open aperture Z-scan because we were looking at the total transmission. Here we gradually increase the gold content. It's a colloidal uh, system. And for a particular value of the gold content, we get a nearly perfect cancellation uh, between these two constituents. It's not perfect, and we think that that's because there's a chi-5 sneaking in, but, uh, but we never bothered to, uh, to follow up on that. Uh, you ask yourself, how in the world do I explain something this complicated when I barely understand it? Let's ignore this. <laughs> let's, let's, let's look at the words. <laughs> OK, so uh, I mentioned before that, uh, that people are very interested in this field of plasmonics. Uh, you can define plasmonics to be photonics using metals. So what we wanted to do is to measure the intrinsic nonlinear optical response of a surface plasmon polariton. I assume that not everybody knows what a surface plasmon polariton is. Last night at midnight, I realized I was in trouble. <laughs> uh, Here's an interface between metal and air. Try to solve Maxwell's equations for the interface between a metal and air. You will find that there is a solution. It's a surface excitation. This propagates along the surface of the metal, and what I drew here was supposed to be a plot of the electric field amplitude as a function of this transverse coordinate that I will call x. 
So this is a surface plasma on polariton. And uh, uh, so the question is, how nonlinear is a surface plasma on polariton? Uh, a nonlinear response would be very useful for applications. Recall that metals are highly nonlinear. N2 is about a million times larger than that of silica. Also, the light is confined to a region much smaller than a wavelength. Okay. You solve Maxwell's equations, you find this remarkable conclusion. I mean, in an optical fiber, the light is confined, but the core of the fiber is many, many optical wavelengths, like 10 wavelengths in diameter. Here, the light is confined to a region smaller than an optical wavelength. Because of that, for a fixed amount of power, you get an extremely large field amplitude. So, so you, might, uh, you might very well uh, hope that you will get a very, very large nonlinear response in a surface plasma on polariton. But there's a problem. Surface plasma on polaritons tend to be highly lossy. So to do such an experiment, what you do is you, here's your metal, here is your air. You fabricate a grating on the surface. You come in with a laser beam. The laser beam excites the surface plasmon that propagates along the surface and then diffracts out here. So you come in with E naught, you leave with E naught, E to the I phi, and you ask how big is the nonlinear phase shift that the light experienced while it was in this altered existence of a surface plasmon. Of course, you would like you would like the nonlinear phase shift to be about pi radians. If it's pi radians, you can just build an interferometer and you can switch from one port to the other output port. Uh, so we did this experiment. Uh, and here we've measured the Kretschmann angle. The Kretschmann angle is the, well, roughly speaking, the angle that most efficiently excites uh, one of these. Uh, we measured an intensity dependence to the Kretschmann angle, meaning that the ref we did directly measure the change in refractive index uh, associated with the surface plasma and polariton. From this, we were able to back out a very accurate measure of the nonlinear coefficient, the chi-3 of gold. But then, when we ask what was the nonlinear phase shift, it was about pi over 10. OK, so, so, uh, so this, was, uh, this was not the answer we wanted. We, we were hoping to find that surface plasma and polaritons would be a good uh, medium to study nonlinear optics. We were off by a factor of 10. We want to redo this experiment at a longer wavelength. At longer wavelengths, light is less. Uh, Metals are less absorbing at, at longer wavelengths. OK, something else. Another way of doing nonlinear optics uh, using structured materials. So uh, this was based on an early prediction of Herb Winful and, and John Seip. So let's imagine an optical fiber. And let's imagine a grating written into this fiber uh, it's called a Bragg grating. And there will be other lectures at this school about optical fibers. So uh, uh, this will probably make more sense later on. Now, the idea of putting a, a grating into a fiber is that the light traveling in the forward direction gets strongly coupled into the backward direction because there's a grating there. And light going in the backwards direction gets coupled into the forward direction by scattering off of that grating. Because of that, there will be a significant buildup of intensity of light in this region. This is like a distributed resonant cavity. Uh, here, for realistic parameters, uh, 
here for realistic parameters, her windfall finds that the stored energy or the intensity of the light can in, be increased by about a factor of three in, in going through one of these materials. Now, uh, this leads to an enhancement of the nonlinear optical response. John Seip at Toronto worked this out, uh, and what he found is that the nonlinear coefficient for a fiber, you really can't talk about N2. N2 is a material property. For a fiber, you talk about the nonlinear coefficient of the fiber, so we use a different letter of the alphabet. We call it gamma. Uh, John Seip found that the, if gamma naught is the nonlinear coefficient of the fiber without the Bragg grating, then in the presence of the Bragg grating, you have to multiply it by this factor here. S is the slowdown factor, the ratio of the group index to the refractive index, which is about a factor of three. So, uh, so this is some work that, that we did uh, motivated in part by some work that was done at uh, Stanford University. Uh, it turns out that if you uh, make your fiber Bragg grading not with a uniform, here I show this as uniform. Each period of this grading has the same amplitude. If instead you modulate the amplitude of the grading, uh, for very, very strange reasons, non-intuitive reasons. Uh, it, it, it turns out that you can get a very much larger slowdown factor. Uh, this is our own results here. We found a group index of about 140. The uh, nonlinear response to first order scales like the square of, of, of the slowdown factor. And the square of 140 is uh, 20,000. That's not bad, right? So, so anyway, we, we did this experiment, uh, and, and we found that there is a, we found optical bistability at only milliwatts of power level. Uh, and, and we do this by measuring the transmission, first as we increase the wavelength, and then as we decrease the wavelength. And you see there's a markedly different response depending on whether the wavelength is going up or coming down. Okay, so uh, let's see, it is, uh, I have to entertain, I'm supposed to entertain you for another hour. <laughs> it's too bad I cannot sing better. Uh, okay, next, next, next topic here is then slow and fast light. So this has been another topic of interest to the uh, nonlinear optics community. And let me just tell you about this sort of from a broad point of view. Uh, so, uh, so there has developed over the past 15 years or so, a community that is very intrigued by being able to modify the velocity of light. And when I say the velocity of light, I'm really talking about the group velocity of light. And the group velocity of light, well, we can express this in terms of a group index analogous to the refractive index. This group index you learned in some of your early classes in physics is the usual refractive index plus omega times dn d omega. Intuition is that in a highly dispersive material, if n is a very rapidly changing function of omega, this contribution will be much larger than this contribution. In fact, the effects can be very dramatic. You can easily slow down the velocity of light by as much as a factor of a million. Well, if dn d omega can be positive, why can't it be negative? That means you can have fast light, meaning that the group velocity is greater than c. And if dn d omega is negative and sufficiently large, you, the group velocity can become negative, meaning that if the energy is flowing in this direction and the phase fronts are advancing in this direction, the peak of the pulse is actually progressing in the opposite direction. Uh, Counterintuitive, uh, but, uh, uh, but entirely consistent with Maxwell's equations and even consistent with uh, causality. Uh, oh, and there, the, so how do we do this? 
Well, uh, there are two dominant ways of controlling the velocity of light. One I talked to you about already, and that is this uh, structure. You induce a structure in the material, such as a Bragg rating, and then the light, instead of going straight through, the light spending more of its time going back and forth and backward and forth. And almost from a mechanical point of view, you slow down the forward progression of the light. Uh, the, the other is to have a very sharp feature in the absorption profile of a material. And, uh, well, if you have a sharp feature in the absorption profile, you will have a corresponding sharp feature in the refractive index profile, and thus a large value of dn d omega. For the next little bit, I will be talking about this, which I will call a material resonance or material slow light. So uh, let's, just rem let's just make it a little more precise, what I just said to you. So let's say you have some material. You have an absorption line that looks like this. Then uh, either by uh, relying on the Lorentz model of the atom or by relying on the kramers kronig relations, you find that an absorption feature that looks like this will always be associated with a refractive index variation that looks like this. Now, the prescription for calculating the group index is you take n plus omega dn d omega. Usually, this second term dominates. So all you do is take the derivative of this expression, and you get something that looks like this. The prediction, then, is that you get fast light at line center. You get slow light in the wings of the line. Now, what if you have a gain resonance instead of an absorption resonance? Well, then. Uh, Again, by Cromer's Cronin relations, this curve just flips top to bottom. So, so here you had dn d omega negative. Here you have a strong dn d omega positive. So here you get slow light on line center and fast light in the wings of the line. So, uh, so just by applying these tricks over and over again, you can get uh, any situation you want, fast light, slow light, backwards light, et cetera. Now, uh, the paper that probably started this whole thing off was a paper of Lena Howe and Steve Harris and Lena's students at Harvard. Uh, this paper was uh, 1999. They showed that they could slow down the velocity of light to 17 meters per second. And they point out that 17 meters per second is a human velocity. A good athlete can pedal a bicycle at that speed. So it sort of breaks a paradigm uh, without even being quantitative. Through most of our lives, we were taught that light goes fast. But, uh, but here's an example of where light went slow, uh, slowing it down to a human velocity. Uh, they did this. They made use of a nonlinear optical uh, uh, interaction known as electromagnetically induced transparency. Since I have linked this uh, lecture to my book, you will find a very nice section on electromagnetically induced transparency in, in my book. Uh, EIT, or electromagnetically induced transparency, was uh, invented or proposed, I'm not sure what the word to use, by Steve Harris at, uh, at Stanford University. Steve was Marty's advisor's advisor? Or did I miss a generation? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so, so, so Marty is part of that generation. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so, so all you have to do is write down the density matrix equations and solve them under this set of circumstances. Uh, and what you find is that the transmission through a dense cloud uh, of, uh, was it rubidium? Did I say it? Uh, a, a dense cloud of, of rubidium. No, sodium. A dense cloud of sodium. Uh, the transmission would ordinarily bottom out, zero transmission. But there is a transparency window that is opened up because of the presence of this uh, coupling field. Note that's a very, very narrow resonance. 
Then by Cromer's Kronig relations, you will have a refractive index that looks like this. Here you get a very, very large dn d omega and a very large slow light effect. So here was the input pulse and here was the output pulse. So the output pulse was delayed by several pulse widths with respect to the input pulse. And this is a very, very scary thing to say related to the work of many others. When I didn't have anybody's name there, then people complained that I didn't have their names. But then when you put a few names, then it gets even worse because the one person whose name you didn't put there gets even more angry at you uh, because you didn't uh, put the name there. So, uh, so oh, this is 15 years ago. Uh, it's not as bad now as it was then. Uh, it used to be I had two versions of this slide, <laughs> and depending on who was going to be in the audience that day, I would either use it or, or, or not use it. Uh, oh, and thank goodness I didn't put my own name here. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so after reading Lena, Lena Howe's paper, I said to myself, hey, that is really neat. But she did this in an ultra-cold atomic gas, you work that hard to build a Bose-Einstein condensate just to modify the velocity of light, there must be an easier way of doing it. I remember around this time I was invited to give the uh, seminar, optical physics uh, seminar at MIT, and who is sitting, uh, who is sitting in the front row, row but Wolfgang Ketterle, who had just won the Nobel Prize for Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, and when I said, you wouldn't, there must be a better way of doing this than to use a Bose-Einstein condensate. There was this enormously pained look on his face that, 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 that why would you want anything other than a, uh, than a BEC? No, but, but here's why. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to do slow light in a room temperature solid state material? Uh, and the reason is that that's, that's almost a device. Uh, that's almost a device if you can do it in room temperature in a solid. You don't have to build yourself a BEC uh, to, uh, uh, to, to enhance the properties of, uh, of transmission lines for telecommunication, for example. And there's two mechanisms that, that we developed uh, in our group to, to do this. Uh, one of them is stimulated Brillouin scattering. Uh, and let me not go through all the details here, except to say that stimulated Brillouin scattering is a gain process. And because it's, or in the language of our conference, it is non-parametric. Okay. So pure gain processes are not parametric processes. Perhaps I'm not supposed to talk about this here. Right. This is a school about parametric processes, but just indulge me, please. Uh, OK. Uh, so. Uh, it's a pure gain process. Because it's a pure gain process, uh, 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 okay, you, you get gain at the Stokes sideband. You get loss at the anti-Stokes sideband. These are symmetric with respect to the pump frequency. Then you apply Cromer's Kronig relations, and you find that uh, you get slow light on the Stokes side and you get fast light on the anti-stoke side. And right around the same time, my group, in collaboration with my former students, Alex Gaeta and Dan Gauthier, were able to demonstrate this. And the group of Luke Tevenaz in, uh, in Switzerland, Luzon, perhaps? Uh, well, we had the same idea around the same time. Uh, so the, the other mechanism that we've made use of is what's called coherent population oscillations. It's a type of saturable absorption, but if you apply a pump laser at omega and a probe laser slightly detuned, well, there'll be a beat note between the two, and this beat note will drive population coherently between the upper and the lower levels. And uh, this uh, leads to... Uh, what's in effect uh, a dip in the absorption profile. 
it's not your typical Doppler profile. It's a coherent effect. But there's still a very narrow dip here, and, and this gives rise to a very strong uh, slow light effect. So uh, we've seen uh, slow light in ruby, ultra-fast light in alexandrite. And here were some of the key papers in which we, uh, we showed these effects. Now, uh, then we started working on an, the erbium dope fiber amplifier. Uh, we think that God must love telecom because erbium, the erbium ion, has a gain feature at exactly 1550 nanometers. And 1550 nanometers is the preferred wavelength for doing telecommunication through an optical fiber. Uh, 1550 is the minimum loss wavelength for an optical fiber. So, I mean, you have, uh, you, you have optical loss falling off as you move to the infrared. You have the infrared loss. You, you, you have the long wavelength tails of the optical absorption, and you have the short wavelength tails of the infrared absorption. Actually, it's a multi-phonon uh, process. Uh, but at 1550 nanometers is, the, is where optical fibers have the lowest loss. Erbium has a strong gain line. So highly schematically, this is the energy level diagram of a uh, erbium doped uh, fiber amplifier. Uh, you, you pump it at some convenient wavelength. 980 is a convenient wavelength. Uh, it's easy to get a diode laser that works there. You excite population to this level, and then uh, you can uh, produce gain at 1550 nanometers. On the other hand, if you don't pump it, then the population remains in the ground state, and then you have loss at this wavelength. And, and in both cases, it's saturable loss or saturable gain. So it gives us the opportunity to get either slow light or fast light, and we control the group velocity of light simply by controlling the intensity of this pump laser. So here, here are some of the experiments that we did uh, here with a sinusoidal Mod modulation uh, of our 1550 signal, you see we can advance or retard a waveform. Here with individual pulses, we can, uh, well, what was it here? Uh, with, indivi well, with individual pulses, we can advance or retard a waveform. Uh, this shows the fractional advancement for this case here as a function of modulation frequency as we gradually increase the power of the 980 nanometer pump laser. But the, the point is that in this one system, we can get either slow light or we can get fast light. So it's a playground. Uh, it's a playground that allows you to test uh, various ideas with slow and fast light. So the, the one that we were particularly interested in, in doing what was uh, testing this prediction of backward pulse propagation. Uh, you recall in uh, maybe five slides earlier, I noted that if the n d omega was negative and uh, sufficiently large, you could find a situation in which the group index actually became negative, meaning that the group velocity is negative and the phase velocity is positive. So, uh, so uh, we found that, uh, that the erbium dope fiber amplifier was exactly the right system in which to do this. Uh, so the 980 nanometer is the pump. 1550 nanometer, we can either uh, put a sinusoidal modulation or carve out pulses. So we send this waveform through the erbium dope fiber and measure what comes out here. Okay, this spike here is just a timing pulse, but here's one specific example where the input pulse looks like this, the output pulse looks like this. So note that the output pulse is, is advanced. It comes out earlier. Uh, it comes out earlier than, than the output pulse. Uh, this might also tell you why we're not violating causality here. I mean, it's not that the output pulse comes entirely before the input pulse. It's just that the peak of the pulse is, is advanced uh, by a fairly large amount. 
Now, uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the wave equation. Let's put in a negative value of the group index, and let's ask what happens if you send a pulse of light into such a material. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to believe MATLAB. Just, yeah. just yeah. do it. Just do it. Just, just uh, take the wave equation. This is the linear wave equation, the, uh, the reduced wave equation, the one we know and love and just put in a region with a negative value of the group index and send in a pulse and you find to your amazement that as the pulse is approaching this material spontaneously a pulse will be generated here it will break into two parts this part leaves before this part enters the backward going part of this double wave meets the incoming wave they annihilate at the input face leaving only this output pulse, and this output pulse has been advanced with respect to how long it would have taken this pulse to propagate through free space. So we did the experiment, and, and, and here's the experiment. Here, here are the results, uh, and perhaps it's not as dramatic as this. I'll tell you why in a minute, but here is the pulse entering the material. So here's the material. Here's the pulse entering the material, Here's the output pulse forming. Here it's starting to split into two. Here it is well split into two. Here's the output pulse leaving before the input pulse enters. The two pulses meet together here, and they, uh, and they uh, annihilate here. Uh, they begin to annihilate here, leaving only the output pulse. OK, so, so, uh, so a strange result. Uh, what do I have next here? Uh, we have come back for a second, but uh, I mean everybody's first thought, including my own, is doesn't this violate causality? Uh, and, and the answer is well, no, it doesn't. Uh, uh, first of all, the group well, first, does it violate causality? No, the group velocity is the velocity at which the peak of the pulse moves. It is not the information velocity. So when we're talking about causality, we say, could one thing influence something else? And uh, that would be the, you'd need a, a negative information velocity in order to get rich at the stock market or, or whatever else you would do if you could violate causality. Uh, this work on negative propagation has sort of led to an enhanced understanding of what we mean by information. It's believed that information is carried by points of non-analyticity of a waveform. And let me try to explain that point. Uh, if, uh, at least in concept, if you know that the, ins that the beginning part of the waveform looks like this, you can extrapolate into the future just by doing a Taylor series expansion. However, if you get to a point of non-analyticity, you just cannot predict what's going to happen here by knowledge of what the waveform was in some finite time interval here. So here are two examples of points of non-analyticity. Uh, so the broad, there's a very broad spectral content at points of discontinuity. So at these points here, the information is encoded at points of uh, the information is encoded at points of non-analyticity. There's a huge spectral content here. The disturbance moves at the vacuum speed of light. So it is now believed that the information velocity is always c. It's the group velocity that can be smaller than c. It's still very, very strange to see the pulse leaving before it enters. But we have to realize that the the information, the knowledge that there is a peak to become later is encoded in the beginning of the pulse. This is almost common sense. If I see the beginning of a pulse here, I know with certainty that there's a pulse coming. Now, maybe I don't know the exact height of the pulse, but you know that there's a pulse coming. So the information, the, the knowledge that there was a, a, a pulse coming is encoded here at least in concept, these are Gaussian pulses. 
the pulse extends from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, so that's why, at least in concept, there is no problem with causality. Uh, let, me go, let me go through this. Uh, I guess I, I, I've never gotten this far into this lecture. So uh, uh, my thoughts may not be straight, but I'm usually not asked to give four, three and a half hours worth of, of lectures on this material. So let's talk, uh, last topic, spontaneous and stimulated light scattering. Now, uh, when you learned about light scattering in your undergraduate quantum mechanics course or electromagnetic theory course, they probably didn't teach it to you this way. This is a new, this is a different insight into understanding light scattering. And the insight is as follows. Light scattering can occur only due to fluctuations in the optical properties of a material. Or to say it differently, a completely homogeneous material cannot scatter light. And, and here's the argument. Let's say you have an incident plane wave. It doesn't have to be plane. Let's say it's a plane wave. You have some small volume element, dV1, scatters light into this direction. Now, for any angle theta, I can find another point, which I will call dV2, separated by a distance lambda over twice sine theta, such that this path length and this path length differ by a half wavelength. Consequently, the scattering from this region will, will interfere destructively with the scattering from that region. And the interference will be complete as long as the amplitude of the light scattered from here is exactly the same as the amplitude of the light scattered from there. Now, if anything breaks that, let, let's say that this is the, it's never blue in Rochester. But it's, the sky is blue here. Uh, so, so let's say that these are two different regions in the upper atmosphere. And we say, well, why is the sky blue? Why doesn't this argument work? Well, because there are fluctuations in the number of gas molecules in any uh, fixed volume in space. And if it follows a... Uh, uh, a, uh, a Poisson distribution. I mean, if on the average you have n molecules in this region, sometimes you'll have n plus the square root of n, sometimes n minus the square root of n. If you, uh, if you go through that argument, you, you find that the sky is blue because these two volume elements in a gas, in an ideal gas, do not contain exactly the same number of molecules. So, uh, so Armed with that insight, we can distinguish between two types of light scattering. We can talk about spontaneous light scattering and stimulated light scattering. We call light scattering spontaneous if the fluctuations, for example, in the dielectric constant occur due to thermal, well, or in principle, quantum mechanical zero point uh, fluctuations. And we call stimulated light scattering if the fluctuations are induced by the incident laser field. So we're specifically interested now in stimulated light scattering. Uh, we're interested in stimulated light scattering, but, let's, but in terms of classification, let's remind ourselves about spontaneous light scattering because there is a theorem that we'll go into a minute that says that for any spontaneous light scattering process, there is a stimulated analog to that process. So, uh, so it behooves us to learn what uh, people in the 19th century were learning about spontaneous light scattering. Uh, 19th? Even 20th, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Brion, well, Rayleigh, 19th century. <laughs> Raman and Brion, uh, 20th century. Okay, so let's consider the following in principle experiment. You have a scattering medium, a gas or a liquid, say, incident light beam, and you look at the light that's scattered off to the side. And what you find, 
Oh, and this one I never corrected. Uh, what you find is that in concept, the spectrum will look like this. Uh, of course, anything scattered to high frequency we call, so this is the laser frequency. Anything scattered to high frequencies we call anti-stoke scattering. Anything scattered to low frequency uh, we call stoke scattering. The, this component that is centered uh, on the laser frequency we call Rayleigh scattering. These two components we call Bruin scattering. This broad background is called the wing of the Rayleigh line. And this very distant scattering is called Raman scattering. This should have been shown as many, many orders of magnitude smaller than this. Uh, these tend to be symmetric, but Raman anti-Stokes is very much weaker than Raman Stokes. And oh, here are some numbers to describe what is going on here. Let me remind ourselves. Oh, okay, so Raman scattering, scattering from the vibrational modes of molecules. Brillouin scattering, scattering from sound waves. Rayleigh scattering, scattering from spontaneous fluctuations in the number of molecules in a fixed volume. Wing of the Rayleigh line, anisotropic molecules, fluctuations in their orientation. Very much like the molecular orientation effect that I mentioned this morning. Now, Bob Hellworth in 1963 uh, pointed out that there is always a relation between spontaneous and stimulated light scattering. And maybe let's not go through the argument right here. But what he says is that if G, uh, okay, for stimulated light scattering, you have an exponential growth of the intensity of the, uh, of the scattered light. And G is this exponential gain coefficient. Uh, this quantity here is called the differential cross-section for light scattering. So if you're doing spontaneous light scattering, you can ask, what is the cross-section for scattering light into a certain solid angle and in a given spectral interval? Okay, so, so this is the concept from spontaneous light scattering. So Hellworth derived this relation telling us how to get the stimulated gain coefficient based on a knowledge of the uh, spontaneous light scattering properties. Okay, so uh, let's just talk about one of these scattering processes and let's let that scattering process be stimulated Brillouin scattering. And just to point out to you just how dramatic this process is, let's say we have a little cell containing water or carbon disulfide or whatever, and let's send a laser beam through it, weak beam, and ask how much of the light is lost due to scattering per centimeter of liquid. And if you put in real numbers, you find that one part in 10 to the fifth of the light is lost to spontaneous scattering. But now there's a process called stimulated Brillouin scattering, and uh, we'll explain the physics in a moment, uh, but uh, this can easily be 50% efficient. So uh, it occurs in the backwards direction. You send a beam of light, you focus it into this material, like carbon disulfide, and you get a very strong beam of light generated in the backwards direction. So dramatically different. It's a quasi-threshold. Above a certain laser power, suddenly you get, uh, you get this very strong backward component. And roughly speaking, this is how much power and how long the pulse has to be in order to get this effect. So, uh, so, so what is going on in SBS? What in the world is it that is leading to this very dramatic increase in, in scattering? So let's say you have a laser beam going in the forward direction. Now, and let's say you have a sound wave also going in the forward direction. And let's say some of this laser light scatters off of the sound wave, turning into a beam of light going in the backwards direction. 
uh, I'll call it E1, omega 1, K1, E2, omega 2, K2, rho, omega, and Q for the sound wave. How do we understand this? We understand this as a positive feedback situation. The, uh, this beam and this beam and can interfere with one another. When they interfere, they will produce a beat note at the frequency of the sound wave. This will tend to generate a sound wave. But now, when the laser scatters from this sound wave, it will produce a Stokes wave. Why Stokes? Well, the sound wave is moving in the forward direction, so there will be a Doppler shift. When the light scatters off the sound wave, it becomes shifted downward in frequency. So, uh, so you, you, you can work this through. Uh, you can work this through that uh, the Stokes frequency is the laser frequency minus the Brillouin frequency, frequency of the sound wave. The Brillouin frequency is the wave vector of the sound wave times the velocity of sound. Uh, but the velocity of sound presumably is measurable. What is Q? Well, Q is the difference of these two K vectors, but since the velocity of sound is much smaller than the velocity of light, then the frequency of the sound wave will be much smaller than the frequency of the light wave. And these two vectors have almost the same magnitude, meaning that Q is about twice a K1. So take that, plug it into here, and you find that the that the typical velocity of this sound wave or the typical frequency by which the Stokes frequency differs from the laser frequency is given by this expression here, twice the optical frequency times the ratio of the velocity of uh, sound to the velocity of light. That is the kinematics but that doesn't explain why there's a coupling. So why in the world does the laser and the Stokes, so how do these generate a sound wave? And for that matter, why is it that the laser light scatters from a sound wave? Well, there, there's uh, something called electrostriction. And electrostriction you know about, even if you don't know that you know about it. <laughs> because when you first studied electromagnetic theory, you probably were taught, uh, learned about a capacitor, and you were told that if you have a bulk capacitor and you put a dielectric material outside of the capacitor, this material will tend to be drawn into the region between the capacitor plates. Now, just generalize that. Take your capacitor plates, immerse it in some liquid. So the liquid is made up of individual molecules. Molecules will tend to be drawn into this region between the capacitor plates. This will tend to increase both the pressure and the, uh, and, and the density of material inside the capacitor plates. Uh, detail consideration tells you that the pressure uh, that, that, that the pressure difference induced by an electric field. This electric field can be a static electric field, in this case here, or it can be an optical frequency field, as shown here. This pressure uh, changes by uh, a coefficient that I'll call gamma uh, times uh, E squared over 8 pi. Uh, e is the electric field strength. This coefficient gamma is called the electrostrictive constant. It's rho times the partial of the dielectric constant with respect to rho. Rho is here the, uh, the uh, density of the material, mass per unit volume. And for condensed matter, this dielectric constant, uh, the, the, this, uh, 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 this electrostrictive constant will be a number of the order of unity. OK, you can see where this is heading. Now, if you know the amount of pressure change, you can calculate the amount that the density will change. If you know the compressibility of the material, you put this all together, and you find that the dielectric constant will change in proportion to the amount that the density changed, which depends on this, which depends on the intensity of the light. OK, so that's the nature of the coupling. Uh, the, uh, uh, the nature of the coupling is that material will tend to be drawn 
into regions of high laser intensity will tend to be expelled from regions of low laser intensity. It's too late in the lecture to do a derivation. I'm supposed to go to four, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to stop soon for questions. I'm going to stop soon for questions. Uh, we love our coupled amplitude equations, right? I solved them once for you today. Uh, Benoit had these same equations in his talk. Now, regrettably, we need the, in addition to the equation for the two electric fields, we need the equation for the material disturbance, the density. Uh, so in addition to the wave equation, you also need an acoustic wave equations. Okay. Oh, it's exhausting. It's exhausting even to think about it. So now, exactly what I, what I did this morning, we're going to do for a more complicated situation here. We're going to write these down. We're going to make the slowly varying amplitude approximation. We are going to turn the wave equation into a paraxial wave equation. We're going to plug it all together. And uh, we're going to plug it all together and we're going to finally end up with equations that look like this. A1 is the amplitude of the laser field. A2 is the amplitude of the sound field. Everything else we've defined, gamma is the, dial is the electrostrictive constant, Q is the acoustic wave vector, uh, refractive index, speed of light, mean density of the material, acoustic frequency of gamma. So big gamma is the damping coefficient of the sound wave. I mean, uh, light waves get, can be attenuated, so can sound waves. Gamma is the coefficient telling how rapidly the sound waves get attenuated. This whole thing out front is some constant. What you see, well, we want to generate Stokes radiation. So the Stokes radiation, the amplitude changes with Z by a constant times something that's proportional to the intensity of the pump wave times the field amplitude itself. Now, you, uh, well, let's come back to here for a second. You look at this and you say to yourself, this is a non-parametric process. Uh, you can see this because it's a pure gain process. You see the, the phase of the pump laser drops out. It's A1 times A1 star. The phase of the laser just does not show up. So there's no concept of phase matching here because the, fa the relative phase of the various waves just does not come into this at all. So it is a pure gain process because dA dz is proportional to A. Everything else here is just a constant. So, uh, so in fact, we can write these in terms of intensities then. Uh, I mean, noting that the phase doesn't matter, why would we have coupled amplitude equations when we can have coupled intensity equations? And they take on this beautifully symmetric form. G naught is then, uh, we can call it the SB stimulated Brillouin scattering gain factor. It's given by just this here. Now, if the laser intensity is not depleted but by the interaction, then we can hold A1 constant, and you see that the amplitude of the Stokes wave simply grows exponentially as a function of distance as the light uh, propagates through the material. Uh, I'm going to spend two minutes walking you through the rest of this, but no more than two. Well, there's something called phase conjugation, and SBS can lead to phase conjugation. Now, everything that I've told you about stimulated Brillouin scattering can be said, but with a few differences for the case of stimulated Raman scattering. In this case, we are talking about a vibrational degree of freedom instead of a sound wave. Uh, go through the theory of this. Uh, 
this is a nice almost summary slide. Uh, stimulated scattering processes. We talked about stimulated Brillouin scattering. We talked about stimulated Raman scattering. But you can also have stimulated Rayleigh scattering, and you can also have stimulated Rayleigh wing scattering. Uh, so just pictorial demonstrations of all of these. This sort of confirms what Bob Hellworth had told to us. For each scattering process, you can talk about a, uh, a stimulated analog of that process. And uh, OK, so we're getting close to the end now. So uh, I just love this. Uh, uh, he, is, he is like an artist. Uh, and this is a demonstration he has in his laboratory. Uh, you know, I told you that people are so intrigued by spontaneous pattern formation and by self-assembly. So he said, hmm, I wonder if I could take my clock, I'll take my clock apart, and I'll put it inside of a beaker in my laboratory, and I will come back every day and see if my clock has self-reassembles itself. And after a year of this, he said, no, no, I guess self-assembly doesn't work under, uh, under these circumstances. But then he started thinking about the work of Harold Urey, uh, who found that if he's, uh, he, he could synthesize was it amino acids by sending sparks into things. And people thought that this might be the origin of life on the Earth, that, uh, that it's, it's the lightning bolts that, that can lead to this type of self-assembly. So, so then he puts some electrodes in this, and he finds that it, uh, it's still, it's st his clock still doesn't self-assemble. So he's just confused as to how in the world self-assembly actually works in the, in the real world. Okay, and I'll stop there. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>